And my friend and colleague, Dr. Tom Jones, is also a student of Dr. Lewis's. Tom is a veteran astronaut, an author, and a planetary science, and uh, he's gonna tell the next part of our story. Thank you. Thanks to this great team for inviting me here today. It's a pleasure to be with these gentlemen up on stage and also with the rest of the uh, Planetary Resources team. I've been to a lot of launches, some pretty exciting ones. I don't think I've been to one that's been as significant, though, for the future of our society and for our future exploration and residence permanently in space. When I was in the shuttle program, uh, I looked for water on uh, the surface of the Earth. We looked at water resources, snowpack, ice cover, with the Space Radar Lab, doing remote sensing of our own planet. When I was a student with John Lewis back there, I was doing remote sensing of asteroids, looking for water on their surfaces, the very resources that we've been talking about this morning. When I went to the space station, I saw the cost of bringing water to our outpost in space today. We all hauled up more than a ton of water on the space shuttle at $20,000 uh, a liter. So it's a very dear material, and it's vital that we find more resources than just the Earth for supplying our teams in space. And so today with the team that's here, I'm going to get to participate with you in starting to break the bonds of Earth by harnessing these resources that await us in space on the nearby asteroids. I've got a, uh, a slide here of the inner solar system. Uh, you can't see it very well, but imagine the, the main asteroid belt between uh, Mars and Jupiter. Uh, Earth flies around the sun every year in a swarm of nearby objects, nearby asteroids and some near-Earth comets. There are literally millions of these objects that come close to us. Uh, we mentioned the known population of about 9,000 asteroids, nearby asteroids that have been detected so far, but that's just a fraction, just about 1% of the ones that are truly out there. From the large asteroids that can do us in, uh, in terms of global damage to our society, there are about, a th about 900 of those, and we have found most of those already through NASA search programs. We range all the way down to the far more numerous smaller asteroids, which number in the millions. For example, um, there are about 500,000 to a million 50-meter objects, as uh, uh, Peter and Eric mentioned. So this is the resource that's out there. Um, they live for about 10 million, 30 million years in the inner solar system before a planet runs into them or they get ejected from the solar system by Jupiter's gravity. Um, because they run into our planet in particular, uh, that means that their orbits come quite close to us. And so there's a small fraction of the asteroid population which is accessible in terms of rocket power. Uh, some of the nearby asteroids have Earth-like orbits in terms of shape and eccentricity or uh, uh, the uh, ellipticity of the orbit. And those asteroids are the, the inviting targets for robotic and human exploration. And we think, for example, uh, of those objects around 50 meters and larger in diameter, there are probably about 1,500 that a human could make a trip to in six months or so. NASA is looking at that number and that population. Of course, we're talking about robotic exploration, so we can go to much more... Uh, distant asteroids than just those that are reachable by human beings. So that's the resource. And we have to find out more about these asteroids, detect them, learn about their characteristics. Just to give you a sense of what they look like, you know that we've sent a couple of spacecraft to nearby asteroids. Here's 433 Eros, which was visited by NASA in 2001 uh, with the near Shoemaker spacecraft. It's about the size of Seattle or uh, Manhattan. Uh, I was actually doing a spacewalk on the space station when we landed the near Shoemaker spacecraft on this object. I thought what a marvel it would be to have humans someday working on these objects, not just on a space station, and here we are today making that process uh, become reality. Um, look in the right of the picture, you see a small little peanut-shaped object. That's a smaller cousin, much more numerous uh, asteroid cousin of Eros. It's called Itakawa, and the Japanese visited there in 2005. Uh, it's about 550 meters across, about a third of a mile, and you can see the boulders and loose material on the surface. We think there are about 2,000 objects, about a half a kilometer in size in the near-Earth population. Um, this one's a rubble pile. It's just held together very weakly by gravity, and if we look at it in close-up, we see the surface of Itakawa as imaged by the Japanese Hayabusa spacecraft. There's a car there for scale. Uh, our robots will be a little bit smaller than that one. But that's the kind of bouldery, loose material that we'll find on these medium-sized asteroids. These are called rubble piles. It shouldn't be too hard to invent a machine like a snowblower that can scoop up some of this material in the future. 
So there's plen plentiful loose material on these objects, and of course there are many more smaller ones than big ones. Now, some of these asteroids, as I've mentioned, have been detected about 1% of the population. They are difficult to find from Earth for a number of reasons. First of all, they're typically smaller objects. Uh, more numerous objects are, tend to be the smaller ones in this population. So from Earth, on the right side of the screen, we can only see these objects when they come close to us in their orbits, when they can reflect enough sunlight so that we can detect them in our ground-based telescopes. Of course, with ground-based telescopes, you can only see them at night. A lot of the asteroid population represented by the, the pink belt in the donut there is on the inside of the Earth's orbit, seen only in daylight for most of their orbits. So we don't have any telescopes that can view them from the ground in daylight. That's why we've got to send prospecting spacecraft to orbit so they can view closer to the sun. And if you get out into space, for example, in deep space, the orange quadrant in the lower left shows you that a space telescope can see a much larger proportion of the asteroid population at any, any given time and then discover them more rapidly. And that's the concept behind our initial uh, hopes to discover and catalog the asteroids. Once you find these objects and catalog them, we've got to look for what they're actually made of. Here's a sampling of how we know what they're made of because of the meteorites that fall on our planet. And these are five images of typical meteorites. The one in the center is the one that's most numerous in terms of falling on our planet at present. That's an ordinary chondrite. It's got native metal. It's got uh, high temperature materials left over from the formation of the solar system. Uh, in the upper right, you see the very familiar nickel iron meteorites that you've all seen in the museums. There are a few percent of the asteroids that, asteroid fragments that fall on us, but they last the longest down here. Lower right, stony iron meteorites, which represent uh, chunks of the core mantle boundary of an ancient protoplanet. And they're very rare on Earth as well. Now on the left side of the screen, you see what are called carbonaceous chondrites. They're a few percent of what falls on us, although a lot more probably hit the top of the atmosphere and are vaporized before they can get to us. They're very crumbly, weak in physical strength. So they're not hard to crush and extract materials from. The best thing about these objects is they're organic rich and they're water rich. So if we can find asteroids, like the carbonaceous chondrites on the left. Uh, that's our water resource, that's our organic material, our chemical resource in space, uh, along with a significant proportion of, of uh, iron oxides and other metals. So that's what we're looking for. We'll try to detect with our prospecting spacecraft those uh, asteroids that have those similar chemical characteristics in space using spectroscopy, the, the colors of the reflected light that they uh, bounce back from the sun to us. Now, what can we do with these materials that are represented by this meteorite knowledge? We can extract water, as we've mentioned, by heating this material gently to a few hundred degrees. It just comes right out of the clay materials. We can distill it and tank it back to Earth, moon space for use here in exploration. Uh, we can also use the bulk dirt on these asteroids for radiation shielding, and we can use the metals for structural materials as we get more ambitious in the use of these raw materials in space. Um, just by simple processes of, of heating with solar heating, or perhaps that from a nuclear reactor, we can use most of the, the materials on these asteroids to create a thriving economy in space. Now, when we get out to nearby asteroids beyond the Earth-Moon system, we're talking about complementing NASA's scientific and human exploration efforts. The commercial sector has the ability to build multiple, simple, small spacecraft that can access these objects. We can accept failures in a way that the government's uh, very expensive scientific spacecraft would not, would not like to accept failure or risk. And they can mount these spacecraft missions, the commercial sector, uh, at a higher pace or a faster pace than the once per decade science missions that NASA is able to afford. So it's quite exciting to see the commercial sector, just as in the launch field, get into the uh, space exploration sector. Once we get to these asteroids with our prospectors, uh, humans and robots can follow to do detailed exploration as well. We're going to augment the knowledge that we gain about asteroids from NASA's and other international space agency efforts and enable human explorers to eventually reach them as uh, NASA's goals call for right now. I believe that we won't have a permanent presence in space beyond the space station in this 21st century unless we can reduce the cost and complexity of life support systems, for example, for the astronauts that we send there. The raw materials that we find on the asteroids can spur not only less costly life support, but also spur industrial processes, uh, the use of solar energy that might even be beamed back to Earth, and of course, making use of the chemicals, the materials we find there in the low gravity environment of, of space, in effectively industrializing the space between the Earth and the Moon with the wealth that we find there. And generating that wealth in space 
can support far more ambitious exploration, uh, as we've mentioned today, throughout the solar system. So, the ultimate goal is going to be to generate new wealth in space. Could you guys advance the slide for me? Uh, I think the team right here has the demonstrable talent, experience, and skills to tap into this new wealth. Uh, it's only a matter of time till it happens, and this team is determined to start making it happen now. Uh, it reminds me of the words of the famous uh, politician and statesman William Jennings Bryan. He might have been speaking about this enterprise today when he wrote about a century ago, saying, destiny is not a matter of chance. It is a matter of choice. It's not a thing to be waited for. It's a thing to be achieved. This is the team to achieve it. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh